I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 203rd episode of this podcast dedicated to anything and everything that you can do to milk the absolutely best workings out of your brain and body, which sometimes means going on far-flung ethnobotanical adventures looking for plants from around the globe, things you might not know about that have something to offer. We've actually got a couple of weird plants from various regions episodes coming up, so I'm feeling a meta theme starting to develop as I look in the future schedule of episodes. But in today's episode, we're going to be talking about a tree called Moringa, considered a food in some places, a potential food as medicine by certain doctors, and a food of last resort, you will hear in other cases. But if it's famine time, a second tier food is certainly better than no food at all. We'll be hearing about Moringa from a couple of experts, one of whom, Dr. Jed Fahey, we spoke with back in episode 190 about the compound sulforaphane, a compound best known for its presence in broccoli sprouts, and also a woman named Lisa Curtis, who has a company working to bring Moringa food products to places around the world where Moringa trees are not endemic. We'll be hearing from both of them in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I'm going to tell you about some dramatic new findings in the scientific quest to understand that universal plague. Yes, I'm talking about contagious yawns. Actually, some progress being made there, and you will find out what in the ruthless listener retention gimmick. But for right now, let's kick things off as usual with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, this week in neuroscience. So the fear of spiders, arachnophobia, is probably one of the best known phobias. Also was a pretty awesome 1980s movie from what I recall. But the question continues to goad scientists on the nature versus nurture aspect of arachnophobia. Is this a learned behavior? Is this an inherent behavior? Is it something more frequently exhibited in people who live in parts of the world where there are more poison spiders around? These have been mostly unanswered questions so far because the confounding factor in a bunch of spider scare studies has been that it's been older kids kids or adults who have been tested. By that point, disentangling what's been a learned behavior versus what's an innate reaction is pretty much impossible. There have been studies on young children to see whether children can identify spiders and snakes faster than harmless animals or other objects. But until now, these had just been tests of identification, not a direct fear response. But that all changed with some research that was just conducted by researchers at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, who showed that even six-month-old children who are still quite immobile and haven't really had the opportunity to learn from direct experience that spiders can be dangerous, still exhibit clear signs of physiological stress when they see a spider, says lead investigator Stephanie Howell. When we showed pictures of a snake or a spider to the babies instead of a flower or a fish of the same size and color, they reacted with significantly bigger pupils. In constant light conditions, this change in the size of pupils is an important signal for the activation of the noradrenergic system in the brain. Even the youngest babies seem to be stressed out by these groups of animals. The researchers also note that pictures of rhinos, bears, and other theoretically dangerous animals don't seem to elicit the same fear responses in babies. We assume that the reason for this particular reaction upon seeing spiders and snakes is due to the coexistence of these potentially dangerous animals with humans and their ancestors for more than 40 to 60 million years, therefore much longer than with today's dangerous mammals. The reaction which is induced by animal groups feared from birth could have been embedded in the brain for an evolutionarily long time. By contrast, distinctly modern dangers like putting your arm into a blender or your finger into an electric socket, every kid needs to be trained individually. As for this stress reaction turning into a full-blown phobia among some adults, the scientists say that the built-in stress reaction predisposes us to think of these animals as dangerous or disgusting. Combine this with social learning or negative first-hand experience, then this could turn into a phobia, says Howell. A strong panicky aversion exhibited by the parents or a genetic predisposition for a hyperactive amygdala can mean that increased attention towards these animals becomes an anxiety disorder. Smart Drug Smarts. The podcast so smart, we have smart in our title. Twice. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews on iTunes. Listener 1220 Jordan from the USA said, Can't get enough. I actually feel strangely luckier than your older listeners because I still have so much more new information that I'm excited about and I'm not caught up to the point where I have to patiently wait for the next new episode. And listener Safety Bob from Canada says, As a man of science and a fan of the scientific method, I greatly appreciate this podcast's non-biased and empirically based approach to examining different smart drugs, biohacks, and the brain. Well, thanks both to Jordan and to Safety Bob and to any others out there, past, present, or future, who might be leaving reviews or have left reviews. It is a great big help. But of course, anything else, other tricks up your sleeve, other ways of letting folks know about Smart Drug Smarts, happy to leave you to your own devices. I'm sure you'll come up with something good. 
We are about halfway through the month of October as I record this. This month, the folks over at Vitamunk have their October surprise deal going on. You can get entered to win any supplement in their arsenal for a full year. You can sign up for that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash October. Several different giveaways there, but a year-long subscription to whatever you like starting in November, and you've got until the end of this month to get signed up. Smart Drug Smarts has a newsletter. We call that the Brain Breakfast. I'm going to be writing something, I think, in the next one about a book that I've been reading. I won't tip my hand as to what it is now, but super interesting book, Scattershot of Topics, written by a variety of scientists. It's probably 10 to 15 scientists have each submitted essays to this book, so you get sort of a shotgun blast of different opinions on the subject matter, which if you're interested in the kind of science-y, but you know, bordering on weird stuff that we talk about on this podcast, I'm sure you'll like this book. I'll, I'll be getting into what that is in the next Brain Breakfast. If you're not signed up for that, you can do so at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. Letter. And finally, a big hat tip to the folks over at Axon Labs, Anna Rob Rhiannon, putting together some cool new content over there, creativity tips, how and why Nexus plays into that. Nexus is the cognitive nootropic stack over at Axon Labs. Sibling stack to mitogen. Mitogen is mitochondrially focused, but really has lots of benefits for the brain there as well. Sulbutyamine, actually, one of the primary ingredients in mitogen, is considered a nootropic in its own right. And you can find both Nexus and mitogen over at axonlabs.io. Smart Drug Smarts. So depending on where you live in the world and what kind of cooking you do, Moringa may or may not be something that's known to you. But the Moringa tree itself, and we actually we have a picture of the Moringa tree on the page for this episode. So if you go to smartdrugsmarts.com slash 203, you can get a look at one of these things. But if you're just listening and you want to imagine this in your mind's eye, it has kind of an unusually thick trunk versus the actual density of the leaves and foliage. If you imagine a potato growing up out of the ground and the body of the potato actually forming the trunk of the tree, that's kind of what it reminds me of. But that not terribly relevant. That's not the part of the tree that people eat. I got turned on to Moringa by Dr. Jed Fahey, who was the guest in episode number 190 of this show. Dr. Fahey is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and his research interests include phytochemistry, the protection against chronic diseases, and specifically, as we'll be hearing about in this episode, the better use of underexploited food resources, of which Moringa is certainly one. And we're also going to be speaking with somebody that he's done scientific consultation for, Lisa Curtis. She is the founder and CEO of a company called Cooley Cooley. The derivation of that name will be explained later. But Cooley Cooley is a company dedicated to trying to bring the benefits of Moringa to parts of the world where Moringa is not a naturally occurring plant. She'll be talking a little bit more about the ethnic history and the ways in which it is eaten. So get yourself ready to hear about the potential secret ingredient for your green smoothie recipe. We are talking Moringa with Dr. Jed Fahey and Lisa Curtis. So Moringa is a tropical crop. The leaves are very high in protein. It's got about 30% protein on a fresh weight basis, which compares to something like spinach or lettuce, which are maybe 1% or 2% or 3%. And it's a highly nutritious protein. So we know that throughout the tropics, in areas where it's been investigated, many local populations eat Moringa either as a famine food, if it's not sort of favored, or as a staple. And so, for example, in India and parts of Pakistan, where it was originated, Moringa is used very, very widely. Now, it also has these isothiocyanates, and the one that it has in particular in many assays is either as potent as sulforaphane, as good as sulforaphane, maybe not so good in some assays, maybe better in others. But on balance, I would say that it's every bit as good as sulforaphane. And how is it that you personally came across Moringa and decided that this is something I want to investigate? I had always been interested in underexploited tropical crops. And in fact, I hosted a, an all-day symposium on the same many years ago. So it's always been a passion of mine. And I did see reference to this plant, Moringa oleifera, back in the early 90s, I guess. And there's a guy who wrote a book called The Miracle Tree, and he was not a scientist. He since passed away of lung cancer, unfortunately. His name was Lowell Fugli, and he wrote this book in French. I got a copy of it in French and tried to plow through it. My French is pretty abysmal these days. And it was translated, and this was sort of the go-to Bible, if you will, for foreign aid workers and Peace Corps workers, and, and especially people who were working in Africa and looking for native plant sources of protein for their constituency or their, their clients, if you will. So that book, it sort of made the rounds and was distributed by carloads and cartloads to aid workers and ministries. And so anyway, word got around the community of people who care about underexploited weird plants. And uh, this book was sort of the, the eye opener for a lot of people. And it talked about 
all of the interesting things that Moringa has now become better known for. And it's just called the Miracle Tree, Natural Nutrition for the Tropics. From a scientific perspective, there was a review paper published in 1996, I think it was, by a guy whose name is Manuel Palada. He was at the time in St. Croix in the, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. He had come from the Philippines. He was immersed in tropical agriculture, and he did a very useful scientific review. And I read that, and I immediately made arrangements to go down to St. Croix and meet him. Of course, it wasn't that painful to go down there. <laughs> right. And we talked about Moringa and sort of got connected scientifically. And my work sort of sprung from really about the time of that meeting, which I guess was in the late 1990s. I think a lot of people probably viewed those two publications as the things that got them interested. I wrote a review on the medicinal or medical properties of Moringa in 2005. And by that time, I had gotten connected with an organization, uh, an NGO or non-governmental organization called Trees for Life in Wichita, Kansas. They were championing Moringa as a way for the very poor people who had very little resources to sort of pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And because it was nutritionally a rich source of protein, and something that grows like a weed everywhere in the tropics, or the dryland tropics anyway. And so Balbir Mathur, who's the name of the founder of Trees for Life and the, the guiding light for many years, was uh, using Moringa in sort of a Johnny Appleseed mode, introducing it to people, showing them how to grow it, and then if they chose to adopt it, great. If not, he didn't try to ram it down their throats. And it caught on in very many places due to his efforts and his organization, Trees for Life. I think they've renamed it Trees for Life International, continues to work with Moringa as well as they have a few other initiatives. I started working with Moringa as a Peace Corps volunteer. I was a volunteer in Niger, West Africa, stationed in a very rural village in, you know, no electricity, no running water, not a lot of healthy food. So I originally started eating Moringa for my own diet because I was feeling pretty sluggish off of beans, rice, and millet. Right. And then I did some research and I was like, wow, this plant is incredibly nutrient dense and it grows in so many countries that have high rates of malnutrition. But as I quickly learned, not a lot of people there were eating it because they didn't really consider it to be a valuable crop. It had this stereotype as kind of a, a poor person's crop. So long story short, I wanted to change that, um, create value around growing and eating Moringa for some of the women I'd been working with in West Africa and ended up doing that by starting to sell Moringa here in the U.S. Moringa is a tropical tree. And its leaves, it looks very much like locust trees for those of you who are take walks outside of the cities uh, in the U.S. And so these small leaves about the size of a penny are prolific. It grows like a weed, but it grows in the tropics. And because it grows in the tropics, I've had my eye on it for over 20 years as a potential dietary intervention for those many, many millions in the world who can't afford a course of antibiotics, who can't afford modern synthetic drugs, but who can, and in many cases desperately want, to find some dietary solution that will help with any of a number of diseases, whether it be prevention or treatment. Why is it that it's had the perception of being a low-value crop if it's so good for you nutritionally? It seems like over enough generations, people would kind of realize, hey, the people that eat this wind up healthy. Let's give this thing another look. Yeah, you would think so. So Moringa is one of the only plants that grows during the hunger season, which is when the last harvest is running out and before the new harvest arrived. So for subsistence farming communities, that's often when you see the highest rates of malnutrition and hunger. And Moringa grows during that time. So it's the same way I think that the Irish would turn to potatoes. A lot of folks in different African countries turn to Moringa. See it as something that they eat when they have to, not something that they eat because they want to. Gotcha. Yeah, even if something's healthy, you probably don't want to eat it all year round. It's true. And, you know, even if you think of kale in the U.S., they say like six years ago, the largest purchaser of kale was actually Pizza Hut because they were using kale as decoration for their salad bar, not for people to eat, just to decorate the top of the salad bar. That's, that's kind of a sad story. Yeah. It has been, and it had been used for 
probably centuries. It originated in the lowlands adjacent to the Himalayas in northern India near Pakistan. My colleague Mark Olson in Mexico, who's sort of the, the expert on the evolution of Moringa and the anatomy and taxonomy, He's been trying to understand exactly where it evolved and how it spread, but but we know that it was used by the ancient Romans. The oil was called ben oil, and it was pressed from the seeds centuries ago. Traces of it have been found in uh, archaeologic relics. It's a high-quality oil that apparently rivals uh, sperm whale oil in terms of its, I guess, its burn ability, but it's also very useful for cooking. And it can replace things like olive oil. So it has been around. It's a sort of scraggly, not a very pretty tree. It can get gangly looking. However, it's been used as a famine food in many areas. It's got an astringent taste, a little bit of a, of a bite, hence the name, one of the names, the horseradish tree. And I think because of that, it may not be the very first sort of go-to food in a lot of cultures. However, People certainly knew it as a famine food. And unfortunately, when things get tagged as famine foods, then when people have enough to eat or don't really need it badly, again, from what I understand, they tend frequently to shy away from it. So it has this cachet of being not the caviar of the of the culture. Of course, a lot of people probably just didn't know that it was so protein rich compared to, for example, many other things that might have been available Frequently, people think of nuts and seeds as rich in protein as well as oils. They tend to think of roots and tubers as rich in starch. They don't think of green leaves as rich in protein. And so the fact that Moringa has something like 10 times the protein of a lot of other green leafy vegetables is sort of remarkable, but may have been missed by many. So I guess the one other point that I would make is it was around, it was widely known, although perhaps not widely consumed as a staple. When aid agencies come in, international aid agencies, what do they throw at people? Corn, wheat, soybeans. In a lot of ways, they control the table when it comes to food aid and what is provided, typically not grown locally either. We yeah. get into all sorts of political discussions about the rights and the wrongs of the ways international aid's provided. I'm certainly sympathetic, and I think they, those agencies do a wonderful job. But they're typically things like corn, soy, and wheat. If I'm eating a traditional meal that makes use of moringa, what would a sort of a garden variety example be? So our name, Kuli Kuli, comes from this African peanut snack where at least in my village, people would often mix in moringa leaves and have this kind of nutty, earthy snack. When I came back, I wanted to create a coolie coolie like snack that would make moringa easy to eat and delicious. That ended up turning into our bars. <laughs> moringa has a similar flavor to matcha green tea. It's got some earthiness, and you often taste a little bit of spiciness at the end, kind of like arugula. But we do find that the same way that people will bake with matcha or, you know, add it into lots of different things, and it, it tastes great, you can do the same thing with moringa. If somebody likes the idea of moringa, they like it nutritionally, but they don't actually like the taste of it, do they have options? Are there supplement forms or other things like that? <laughs> yeah. So there's different folks who sell Moringa pills or Moringa capsules. But we've found that because, you know, in order to truly get the benefits, you need 10 grams of Moringa a day. It's kind of hard to get that in a capsule. You're talking about, you know, yeah, it's the size of a horse pill. Yeah, exactly. And the extracts haven't really been proven. And there's some scientists that say, stay away from the extracts, go for the real thing. So what we do is I'll raw process our Moringa powder. So it's you know, basically the fresh leaves ground up and dried. One of the areas I know you have a lot of interest in is, is thinking of food as medicine. Tell me some of the difficulties there as far as food preparation and how the ripeness or the, the right growth phase of the plant might really matter as far as what comes across medicinally. I'm very much a fan of food as medicine because I think dosing is sort of a moving target, but it's a safely moving target. We know that there are phytochemicals of value, of benefit. We know that, that something like Moringa, for example, is rich in a variety of vitamins and minerals and glucosinolates like what we find in broccoli. So, you know, I think encouraging people to eat more of them or more of Moringa, for example, or broccoli. And 
it's obviously a, a fairly long list of things we could put on that list of food as medicine. Instead of eating, for example, iceberg lettuce, I think is a good thing. I'm not knocking iceberg lettuce. I don't want the lettuce growers of California to send me hate mail. But I mean, I think most people acknowledge that there's a lot of water and iceberg lettuce and that it's not particularly nutrient rich. So if you're going after a phytochemical boost instead of just a, a sensory experience, then I would certainly choose something like moringa or spinach or kale or broccoli or bananas, a long list of foods, rather than something that is much less nutrient, vitamin, mineral, and phytochemical rich. I think it's fair to say that food can and I think should be used as medicine to the extent that it can be. I've been in this academic nutrition business for 24 years now, and before that I was in the biotech industry. And I've always thought that part of my job as a thinking, caring, and hopefully somewhat intelligent person interested in plants and nutrition was to persuade people to eat better diets. In this country, I don't think we've moved the bar very much in 30 or 40 years. And I think you could argue that most people still don't eat good diets, but they're happy to pop vitamins and pills, cure whatever ails them. But then you look at people who are starting to get long in the teeth, as they say, like me, people who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s. Well, I think it's possible to tell someone who's athletic or who moves around a lot and is in their 20s, 30s, 40s, that they get everything they need in, in a balanced diet. I think that probably come, becomes less true as we get up into our 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So if somebody has some Moringa powder and they're doing some cooking, they're looking for something that they could substitute out, maybe put the powder in and wind up with something with more protein, more healthy than it would otherwise be. Are there some good substitution options for things people would normally be cooking with anyway? Yeah, absolutely. I do it all the time. Anytime I don't have any spinach or kale in my fridge, I'll sub in Moringa powder and curries. I eat it every morning with a little bit of almond butter in my oatmeal, which is really delicious. And of course, the biggest one that people use it for is green smoothies. We find that a lot of folks love it as a, a boost to their morning smoothie. What are some of the health benefits that people might expect and I guess both expect based on anecdote and actually on scientific study? You know, anecdotally, there's a lot of people who know about Moringa's anti-inflammatory effects and particularly as that relates to chronic inflammation caused by things like diabetes. It's something that is starting to be studied. And there have been a few clinical trials, but not enough that, you know, we can make claims on our packaging. But it's really interesting to see how many people we find, particularly in the Hispanic culture, actually, who tell us that their grandparents know of Moringa as like, oh, this is the herb you should eat to help manage diabetes, manage your weight. And so a lot of people in those communities eat it for that. So we actually recently started sourcing from some farmers in Nicaragua. There's more and more people in South and Central America who are getting interested in Moringa. Is it the same strain of Moringa that grows in the Americas as you originally came across when you were in Africa, or are there lots and lots of varieties out there? We find that people are generally using the PK-1 Moringa oleifera. It's the one that was first popularized in the Himalayan region of India and since has spread really all over the globe. So we, in terms of our sourcing to keep everything consistent, we only source the same strain of Moringa. Like in the Philippines, for example, where Moringa is the national vegetable, we find a lot of folks who come up to us and say, this is like a weed. I used to grow this in my backyard. <laughs> so it is quite easy to grow. So the study that I want to do and that we are looking for funding for right now is with the collaborators in Israel, which is a tropical country after all, but it's a country where it's quite easy to do clinical studies because it's a developed country. But it would be a good platform from which to launch any successful observations into other tropical areas. And so the proposal is that we do a study very, very much like the studies that are being done in the U.S. with broccoli sprouts now or broccoli sprout extracts or supplement, and that we essentially replicate that study 
with a population of autistic children in Israel using Moringa. Very safe, and it has the proper compounds. And we look for similar effects. Take blood samples, look for biomarkers of inflammation, and look for remission of symptoms. For a number of years now, there has been it's somewhat of a push saying, hey, you've got this. This is healthy. You really ought to be eating more of it. it. Has that been having an effect? Is it becoming more popular? So the Philippines, we've definitely seen a big rise of Moringa. And part of the reason that the government proclaimed it the national vegetable is because they've been really promoting it as this natural source of nutrition for their country. And we've also seen in India, people know Moringa as the drumstick tree. And a lot of folks consume the seed pod, which is different than the part that we work with. We work with the leaves that are the most nutrient dense part. But the tree also produces this like kind of oversized green bean that if you drink sambar, like Indian soup, you'll often see that moringa drumstick in there. Is there any nutritional overlap between the seed pods versus the leaves or are they totally different? Similar benefits, you just don't get quite as much of the protein and the iron and the antioxidants. It just uh, seems to have kind of lower levels of everything. If I can ask without spoiling any trade secrets, what's the preparation process like to turn the leaves into a powder? So basically, we work with farmers who strip the leaves off the tree. It doesn't hurt or kill the tree at all. They wash them and then mill them into a fine powder. And so that powder we sell as a raw organic powder. And we also add it to our date and nut bars and then into this natural green energy shot. So you've actually been out in stores for a while now. You said you're nationwide with Whole Foods and some other regional chains. How is the public awareness? Do a lot of people know about Moringa or is this something where there's still a lot of consumer education that needs to happen? We've definitely seen a big rise in demand for Moringa and an awareness of Moringa. One of the things we're trying to do now is explain the real quality behind our Moringa powder because we started seeing competitors who are growing Moringa on less good soil on sort of factory farm in it produce much lower levels of nutrients. And we often see a lot of Moringa issues with heavy metals. So trying to communicate why we spend so much time thinking about quality control and why we grow it in the places where we grow it. Yeah, it seems like soil quality with vegetables is a really important thing that people don't think about. It's like, oh, well, you know, a stock of broccoli is a stock of broccoli. And now a lot of people think about organic, but you could be organic and still be grown in crappy, depleted soil, and you're still not going to get a great vegetable out of that. You mentioned kale earlier, which has been certainly gaining in popularity because it's been becoming better known that it's healthy. And from what you said, Moringa compares pretty favorably with kale. Moringa has twice the protein, it has way more B vitamins, and also six times the iron. So we find that particularly for vegetarians, vegans, or people who aren't consuming a lot of meat, the fact that Moringa is a green that has all of your essential amino acids, so providing that complete protein is really important. And then the iron and the B vitamins are great for anyone. Is there anyone for whom Moringa might not be advisable based on its reactions within the body? Have you seen any like allergic reactions? Is, is there anybody for whom it should be a no-fly zone? I have seen none. I think it's one of those things, just like broccoli for that matter, where your body's going to tell you when it's had enough due to the fact that it may give you some gas. It may be you, you just don't enjoy the taste because it does have a sort of horseradishy taste. We've probably sold hundreds of thousands of <laughs> Moringa products at this point. We've heard one person who told us that she got a rash, but it sounds like she's also very sensitive to other cruciferous vegetables like broccoli. So that's kind of the only one we've heard. We haven't seen any research on it, but qualitatively we've gotten that. And then we also have heard, you know, Moringa is very high in fiber. And so the same way if you eat a huge amount of kale, definitely kind of cleanses you a bit. You know, we tell people start with a tablespoon or a little bit less and then kind of work your way up. That's one of the joys of eating food though, right? If you take tons of pills, if you if you take something like a Soylent, sure, you can get all the nutrients you need, but you may not know when to stop. 
if you eat food, there's a bulk to it and uh, there's a taste aversion that grows as you get more and more full, satiated. So you certainly could eat too much moringa if you forced it on yourself. But I think if, when it's eaten in um, cuisine, normal to an area, and it's used as a substitute for green leaves or for other protein sources, I certainly haven't heard of any indications not to consume it in moderation. The taste may keep some people from eating it, and some people may even say that they're allergic to it because they just hate the taste of it, for example. But I think true food allergies are a lot more rare than most people think, and I've seen or heard no evidence that this is uh, something which provokes allergies. Do you think that from a regulatory perspective or sort of a government advisory perspective with potentially therapeutic foods in the future, there might be more guidance on preparation and dosages and things like that? Or it's still going to continue to be, you know, here's the ingredients on the box. Good luck. Probably uh, one day I'll either have diabetes or rampant heart disease or cancer. I'm 63 years old. One of those things is probably going to get me. So when I get one of those conditions, as so many people have, I would like to be able to say, okay, maybe eating broccoli isn't enough. I'd like to be able to get it in a supplement. And I'd like to have our regulatory authorities say, hey, this works to treat or to prevent a disease. So it's okay if you take it. And right now, they're refusing to even come close to that line. One of the things that we wanted to be very careful was that we weren't making any claims about Moringa that the science didn't support. Is this actually strong enough science that we can say it? There's a lot of folks out there, especially online, who say all sorts of things about Moringa can cure cancer, Moringa does this, Moringa does that. It's an amazing nutrient-dense plant, but it is not a cure-all. Smart Drug Smarts. So a big, big thank you to Dr. Jed Fahey and to Lisa Curtis for taking the time for those interviews. Next time somebody asks you what the official national plant of the Philippines is, you're going to have a one-up on them in any Trivial Pursuit contest. But yeah, Moringa, it's out there. It's worth knowing about. It's probably nutritionally not on a lot of people's radar screens yet. But after this episode, you can consider yourself one of the people in the know. The taste might not be for everyone. It's definitely something that might be considered an acquired taste. But if you are culinarily adventurous, it's probably worth giving it a day at court. You can find Lisa Curtis's company online at coolycoolyfoods.com. That's K-U-L-I for the spelling of coolie. And you can find Dr. Jed Fahey and all of what he's working on up online at jedfahey.com. His last name is spelled F-A-H-E-Y. And I know that they are still seeking research dollars for that study he mentioned, looking at the therapeutic potential of Moringa for autistic children. So if you are the research funding type or connected with an organization that is, definitely check out his website and reach out. And if you are the type of person who is curious about contagious yawns, then keep listening because that's what we've got coming up next in the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So there was a major seismic shift in the world of yawn research in 2007 and then again confirmed in 2010 when it was shown that age-matched peers in autistic and non-autistic children showed variation in how likely they were to catch a case of the contagious yawns, whatever you want to call that, seeing somebody else yawn and yawning yourself. That was something that you are more likely to do if you are not autistic than if you were autistic. Does autism inoculate against contagious yawning? Do we care? Is this good or bad? These were the sorts of items of controversy that erupted 10 years ago when these new findings were released. It was immediately conjectured that something about autistic children and perhaps their inability to recognize the emotion of others must be accounting for this lessened sensitivity to social yawning contagion. Something about that feature of their minds, less empathy, less recognition of, gosh, that person's obviously tired. Maybe I should be tired too. Now would be a good time to yawn. Such has been the working hypothesis for much of the last decade. But not so fast, say researchers at Tohoku University in Japan. In research published just this summer in the journal I perception, they hypothesize that the differences that autistic individuals have with empathy might be sort of a red herring, a false clue as to what's the difference of this yawning contagion. So they pulled out their high-speed cameras and they photographed people yawning. Imagine lots of time-lapse photos of various degrees of yawn, the oncoming yawn, the big super stretch jaw, then the, you know, putting your hand in front of your mouth, maybe. You can imagine how some of these photos might telegraph, yes, a yawn is definitely happening here more than others. So the researchers took a bunch of healthy volunteers. They gave them a test to find out where they lay on an autism spectrum, finding out a number called their AQ, their autistic quotient. As autism isn't a binary, you've got it or you don't sort of thing. It's much more a series of related tendencies, and it's a spectrum disorder. The people on the far end of that spectrum, we tend to say this person is autistic, but there's no clear dividing line. 
So healthy volunteers, they get an idea of how autistic a person is or isn't, and they showed photos, and they asked, is this person yawning, yes or no? They also had a control group where people were asked to look at photos of people who were either happy or angry, and they were asked an equivalent binary question, is this person happy or angry? Each participant in different phases of the test was shown both types of photos. As all this was going on, they were also videotaping the people as they were taking these tests, secretly videotaping them to see whether they themselves yawned or not. In the case of the non-control group, looking at these photos of ambiguously yawning people, whether they themselves would be more likely to yawn. The people in the control group, if they were yawning, that was assumed to just be a natural yawn, not a social contagion yawn. And what they found from all of this was that the people who were better at detecting yawning from an ambiguously yawning face were more likely to be susceptible to the contagious effects of social yawning. However, a person's being able to accurately diagnose whether somebody in a photo was happy or angry, that didn't seem to have any bearing on how likely a person was to pick up social yawns. This led the researchers to find the perceptual ability, just the ability to distinguish factually, is this a yawn, yes or no, is actually at the root of the disparity in yawning contagion between autistic and non-autistic children, said the lead researcher, Dr. Chi Hui Sheng. We find that for a non-clinical population, perceptual ability is more closely related to contagious yawning than empathy is. Since it's been documented that people with autism tend to suffer from impaired perception, such as atypical eye gazing on faces and a difficulty in judging facial emotions, it's possible that their perceptual limitation causes them to be unable to detect someone else's yawning expression. The other fact that stood out from this study is that when you held everything else constant, female participants were much more susceptible to contagious yawns than males. And just for the record, although I'm wide awake as I record this, looking at all these photos of people's yawning has definitely induced me to yawn a couple of times. Smart Drug Smarts, where we turn information into sound into bits into packet data that turns back into bits and sound and then into neurotransmitters that release funds that release mail-order synthetic chemicals that cross the blood-brain barrier to release augmented performance from your brain. Okay, so that was it for episode number 203. Thank you for hanging around with us until the very end. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find everything that we talked about here up online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 203. Last week in episode number 202, we talked about neurogastronomy, the science of taste, flavor, and how those are built in the brain, with doctors Tim McClintock, Dong Han, and synesthetic chef Taria Camarino. And next week's going to be our last episode before Halloween. Doesn't exactly correspond with Halloween, but we do have a a very spooky topic, which actually does deal with neuroscience. So going to be having kind of a Halloween warm up edition of Smart Drug Smarts. You can come in costume if you want. And if you do take a photo, send it to us. But see you back here next week. Same time, same podcast. And with that same unflagging commitment to helping you fine tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.